page 270. Those of you that are mad at me for what I did on the last chapter, I just had to click another link. What I see. Remember, um, if you ha it's been a while since you've read with me. Um, Ivan was wondering why the humans were excited and then they, the, there were three windows in his cage and there was these wooden slats, kind of like blinds, blocking the other side and they move those aside and here is what Ivan sees. Gorillas, three females and a juvenile male. That sounds familiar. He was watching something. It's the family I've been watching, but they're not on a TV screen. They're on the other side of, a, of the glass. Watching me, watching them. I see me, lots of me. Still there. I cover my eyes. I look again. They're still there. Page 272, watching. Every day, I watch them through my window the way my visitors used to watch me. See how they chase, groom? See how they play, sleep? See how they live? They're graceful the way Stella was, moving just enough, only as much as they need. They stare at me, heads tilted, pointing and hooting, and I wonder, are they as fascinated by me as I am by them? Page 273. She. Her hoots make my ears hurt. I admire her intact canines from afar. Her name is Kenyani. She is faster than I am, spry and probably smarter, although I am twice her size, and that too is important. She is terrifying. And beautiful, like a painting that moves. So for Ivan to compare her to a painting, it's interesting, very ironic. Um, he complains about her hoots hurting, but then talks about how he likes her teeth. Um, she ta he talks about how terrifying she is and then how beautiful she is. Sounds like somebody has a crush. Door. Today, the humans lead me to a door. On the other side, Kenyani and the others wait for me. I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready to be a silverback. I'm Ivan, just Ivan, only Ivan. I decide it's not a good day to socialize. I'll try again tomorrow. So Ivan, this big mighty silverback, is literally going through the same things that you probably go through at the beginning of the school year or when you go to a new event or when you see your cousins for the first time in a long time. You know, that first moment where you have a chance to talk to everybody and everybody just sort of sits there and stares at each other and then maybe doesn't. Take some time and you can see maybe why they didn't just throw Ivan in. They're getting each other. They're getting the ape group, the gorilla group used to each other. Wondering, page 275. All night I lie awake, wondering about Ruby. Has she already walked through a door like the one I'm facing? Was she as scared as I am? Scared the way she must have been that day she fell in the hole? I think of Ruby's endless curiosity and of the question she loved to ask. Have you ever danced with a tiger, Ivan? Will your fur turn blue? Why doesn't that little boy have a tail? If Ruby were here with me, she'd be asking, what's on the other side of the door, Ivan? Ruby would want to know, and she would have been through that door by now. So now the silverback is learning something from the baby elephant. Ready. Want to try again, Ivan? Maya asks. I think of Ruby, and I tell myself it's time the door opens. I should stop there. Yeah, I think I will.
just kidding. Outside at last. He went through the door. Sky, grass, tree, ant, stick, bird, dirt, cloud, wind, flower, rock, rain, mine, mine, mine. Really cool chapter, almost like a poem. Notice all of the things that he notices are all things that he talked about way back at the beginning of the story. Think about it. It's the first time he's been outside in 27 years. Oops. Page 278. I sniff, approach, strut a bit, but the others don't welcome me. They have sharp teeth and loud voices. Did I do something wrong? Kinyani chases me. She throws a stick at me. She corners me. I know it, that she's testing me to see if I'm a true silverback, one who can protect her family. I cower and hide my eyes. Maya lets me back into my cage. What it was like. I lie awake and try to remember what it was like being a gorilla. How did we move? How did we touch? How did we know who was boss? I try to think past the babies and the motorbikes and the popcorn and the short pants. I try to imagine Ivan as he might have been. Pretending. The juvenile male approaches. He's eyeing my food hungrily. I imagine a different Ivan, my father's son. I grumble and swat with swagger. I beat my chest till the whole world hears. Kinyani watches, and so do the others. I move toward the young upstart, and he retreats. Almost as if he believes I'm the silverback I'm pretending to be. Remember when I told you guys to pretend to smile when you're not happy, and sometimes that smile will make you happy? Ivan is doing that a little bit. He's pretending to be a silverback, but guess what? When a gorilla pretends to be a silverback, he's actually being a silverback. Nest. I'm making a nest on the ground. It isn't a true jungle nest. The leaves are inferior and the sticks are brittle. They snap when I weave them into place. The others watch, grunting their disapproval. Too small, too flimsy, an ugly thing to see. But when I climb into the leafy cradle, it's like floating on treetop mist. Simile. Picture of. He's complaining. It's not like all the stuff from when he was a kid, but it's better than what he had before. More TV. Maya wants me to go back to my glass cage. I can tell because she is tempting me toward the door with a trail of tiny marshmallows. I try to ignore her, but I, I don't want to leave the outside. It's a cloudless day, and I found just the right spot for a nap. But I relent when she adds yogurt raisins to the trail. She knows my weaknesses all too well. In the glass cage, the TV is on. It's another nature show, jerky and unfocused. I expect to see gorillas, but none appear. I hear a shrill sound like a toy trumpet. My heart quickens. Prediction, who is it? I rush close to the screen and there she is. Ruby. She is rolling in a lovely pool of mud with two other young elephants. Another elephant approaches. She towers over Ruby. She strokes Ruby, nudges her. She makes soft noises. They stand side by side just the way Stella and Ruby used to do. Their trunks entwine, great word, entwine. I see something new in Ruby's eyes and I know what it is. It's joy. I watch the whole thing, and then Maya plays it again for me and again. At last, she turns off the TV and carries it out of the cage. I put my hands to the glass. Maya looks over. Thank you, I try to say with my eyes. Thank you. It. K. 
Kinyani ambles toward me. She taps me on the shoulder and Knuckle runs away. I watch her, arms crossed over my chest. I'm careful not to make a sound. I'm not sure what we're doing. <laughs> she, she ambles back, shoves at me, dashes past, and then I realize what's happening. We're playing. We're playing tag. And I'm it. So, Kinyani is playing tag with him for the first time since he used to play tag with his sister. But so the next chapter, romance. <sighs> Make eye contact. Show your form. Strut. Grunt. Urgh. Throw a stick. Grunt some more. Make some moves. <sighs> romance is hard work. It looks so easy on TV. I'm not sure I will ever get the hang of it. <laughs> More about romance. I wish Bob was here. I could use some advice. I try to recall all the romance movies we watched together. I remember the talking, the hugging, the face licking. I'm not very good at this, but it's fun trying. Grooming. Is there anything sweeter than the touch of another as she pulls a dead bug from your fur? I would say no. Talk. Gorillas aren't chatty like humans, prone to gossip and bad jokes. But now and again, we swap a story under the sun. One day, it's my turn. I tell my troop about Mac and Ruby and Bob and Stella and Julia and George about my mother and father and sister. When I'm done, they look away silent. Kinyani moves closer, her shoulder brushes mine, and we let the sun soak into our fur together. The top of the hill. So think about how far Ivan has come in the past like 30 pages. He went from living with Mac in a cage to now in a zoo with his own troop. Um, a lot of times these things don't work out very well, but clearly for Ivan it has. The top of the hill. I've explored every nook and cranny of this place, except for a hill at the far end where workers have been repairing a wall. They're finally gone. They have left behind fresh white brick and a mound of black dirt. While the others lay in the morning sun, I want to explore the hilltop. They've been there before and I have not. Everything is still fresh to my eyes. I take my time going uphill, savoring the feel of grass on my knuckles. The breeze carries the shouts of children and the drowsy hum of bumblebees. Near the top of the hill is a low-limbed tree, the kind my sister would have loved. The wall is endless, clean and white, stretching far down to the, ha to the habitats beyond my own. It's high and wide, carefully built to keep us in and others out. This is after all, still a cage. It rained last night and the pile of dirt is soft to the touch. I scoop up, scoop up a, but a handful and breathe in the, lo the loamy smell. It's a rich brown color, heavy and cool in my palm and the wall waits like an endless black billboard. Big pile of mud, big white wall the wall. Page 291. It's a big wall. It's a big pile of dirt and I'm a big artist. I slap handfuls of mud on the warm cement. I make a handprint. I tap my nose with a muddy finger. I make a nose print. I slide my palms up and down. The mud is thick and hard to use, but I keep moving and scooping and spreading. I don't know what I'm making and I don't care. I make swoops and swirls and thick lines, figures and shapes, light and shadow. I'm an artist at work. When I'm done, I step back to admire my work, but it's a large canvas and I'd like to get a better view. I go to the thick limb tree and grab the lowest branch. I try to swing up my legs. Oomph, I land hard. I'm too big to climb, I suppose. I try again anyways, and this time I pull myself onto the first limb, gasping for breath. One more limb, two, and I can't go any further. Perched halfway up the tree, I see my troop still dozing contentedly. I take in the wall, 
splattered and splashed with mud. Not much color, but lots of movement. I like it. It feels dreamy and wild, like something Julia might have made. From my seat in the tree, I can see beyond the wall. I see giraffes and hippos. I see deer with legs like delicate twigs. I see a bear snoozing in a hollow log. I see elephants. I wonder if they've done all this on purpose. Page 294, safe. She's far away, belly deep in tall grass with others by her side, Ruby. She's here, Stella, I whisper. Ruby's safe, just like I promised. What a great picture. Remember, the whole point of this book once Stella passes away is for Ivan not to get out, but to get Ruby safe, and he's done it. I call to Ruby, but the wind tugs at my words, and I know she'll never hear me. Still, Ruby pauses for a second, her ears spread wide like tiny sails. Then, with lumbering grace, she moves on through the grass. Page 296. Silverback. It's a cloudy evening, chill and drizzly. Dinner is on its way, but I don't care. At night, we sleep in our den, but I'm always the last to head inside. I've been inside long enough. This time of day, there aren't many visitors, just a few stragglers leaning on the wall that separates us. They point, take a couple of photos, then head over to the nearby giraffes. One of our keepers is beckoning. Reluctantly, I turn to go. Out of the corner of my eye, I see someone running, I pause. It's a girl with dark hair, lugging a backpack. A man follows behind, racing to catch up. Ivan, the girl yells. Ivan, it's Julia. I scramble to the edge of the wide moat that skirts the wall. Julia and George wave at to me. I dash back and forth, hooting and grunting, doing a gorilla dance of happiness. Dusty, it's dusty. Calm down, says a voice. You're behaving like a chimp. I freeze. A tiny, nut brown, big eared head pops out of Julia's backpack. Nice place, Bob says. Bob, I say, it's really you. In the flesh, how, where, I can't seem to find any words. There's Bob right there. George's job at the zoo doesn't start till next month. George's job at the zoo doesn't start till next month, so he and Julia made an arrangement. She's walking three extra dogs to cover my food, and get this, they're all poodles. <laughs> you said you didn't want a home, I say. Yeah, Bob says, but Julia's mom likes my company, so I figure I'm doing everybody a favor. It's a win-win. Julia pushes Bob's head back inside her backpack. You're not supposed to be here, she reminds him. Ivan looks great, doesn't he, Jules? George asks. Stronger, happier even. Julia holds up a little photo, but it's too far away for me to see. It's Ruby, Ivan. She's with other elephants now because of you. I know, I want to tell her. I saw with my own eyes. We stare across the expanse that separates us. After a while, George pats Julia's arm. Time to go, Jules. Julia gives a wistful smile. Bye, Ivan. Say hello to your new family. She turns to George. Thank you, Dad. For what? For, she gestures towards me. For this. They turn to leave, the lamps that light the zoo, pathways blink on, blanketing the world with yellow light. I could just make out Bob's little head <laughs> sticking out of Julia's backpack. You are the one and you are the one and only Ivan, he, he calls. I nod, 
then turned toward my family, my life, my home. Mighty Silverback, I whisper. I gotta make sure they clean the dust out of this room. And that's it, the one and only Ivan. We finished, yay! Um, there is a little more that I'm gonna say for in the classroom. Um, a couple of surprises for you. Um, for bonus money, for those of you that get to this part, write a paragraph telling me what you think about this book. Um, for those of you that get to the end and write this paragraph, you will buy yourself a ticket to make your first video review of the one and only Ivan Mighty Silverback. Thanks for reading with me on to Lemonade War. Bye.